The Bible is one of the most referenced books in the world. Over the last few decades, an intense religious and scientific debate has been building around the idea of ETs in the Bible. In 2014, the Center for Theological Inquiry, a research institute in New Jersey, was awarded $1.1 million by NASA to study, quote, the societal implications of astrobiology, unquote. In other words, what would the overall impact be on religions if they were to discover we're not alone in the universe? Is it possible that a distant race of ancient aliens once inhabited the lands of the Bible? And if so, are we part of their legacy? When we're reading the Bible, we always have to look to the first page to see which version of the Bible are you reading? The New International Version, the New New International Version, the King James Version, the St. Jerome Version. Which version are you reading? Because the language is going to be different. So if we were to write, for example, the ET version of the Bible, we'd go back to every story where it says, and the heavens opened, and realize they're, they're talking about a stargate. What else could be the heavens opening but the, a rip in the fabric of space-time? And so this is a way we can start to connect with what the ancients were actually seeing or experiencing. Their language was different from ours. They would say, the heavens open. We would say, oh, a stargate open. It's as much a function of language that separates us from true understanding as it is anything else. There are so many references of extraterrestrial contact in the Bible. There are 70 verses describing clouds as vehicles, 15 verses describing pillars, 10 verses describing dwellings as vehicles, 160 verses describing lights and fire as vehicles. There are 17 verses describing spinning wheels and also 22 verses describing dark and shining objects as vehicles. There's also 37 verses of various objects in the Bible that describe UFOs as flying furnaces and burning bushes. So as you can see, Based off of the vocabulary of the people of those times, they can only use words that would help them describe what we would call nowadays UFOs. The Bible begins with the book of Genesis, and it ends with the book of Revelations. In between are dozens of stories that reference what many scholars suggest may be extraterrestrial phenomena. Genesis 6-4 describes the sons of God coming and bearing children with the daughters of man. This begs the question, who were the sons of God? The ultimate example of an extraterrestrial intervention in the Bible is Genesis chapter 6. This is where the fallen angels, the watcher angels, descend onto the earth plane, take on physical incarnation, and have sex with human females, creating a hybrid offspring referred to as the Nephilim. These are described as the mighty men of renown. Why is that? What does it mean what, to say that they're mighty men? What distinguishes a mighty man from an ordinary human? And the answer is, is that these fallen angels are considered to be equivalent to, if not the same as, the Anunnaki of Sumeria. The Anunnaki possessed a cloak or a garment called the Malamu that gave them superpowers. So what this is saying is that the Nephilim were the mighty humans who possessed this cloak or garment of the Anunnaki. And just like the Anunnaki, when they had the Malamu on, they're radiant, they're shining, they're luminous, and they have superpowers. So this is another hidden reference to technology in the Bible. That kind of interaction actually talks about the Nephilim actually interbreeding with uh, human women. That's a pretty big influence. Inside of our DNA, there's a programming language there. It's been left by our progenitors. When we crack this code and when we figure out who we are and where we're going, we'll realize that our destiny is in the stars. Therefore, we have to ask ourselves, if we go back to the Genesis story, were these a very advanced group of geneticists that made us as a hybrid species? There are accounts like this that have appeared uh, the former that I was referring to actually in the Bible itself, but other sources of ancient uh, origins like that, uh, such as the, the uh, tablets that Zechariah was translating, that seem to be 
indicative of accounts of these other beings interacting with us. Walter Matfield states in his book, Eden Serpent, Its Mesopotamian Origins, that the Garden of Eden belonged to the Anunnaki, lending more credence to the serpent not just being a biblical creature, but a member of the Anunnaki. Let's think of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. This is some type of a reptilian type of being that we've been taught to be afraid of. It's a, a wisdom bearer. It's in the Gnostic Gospels, they describe it as this bright snake, this illuminated snake taking on a humanoid form. We have the winged serpents that are described in the Bible, angels as winged serpents, humanoid beings with serpentine faces that can spin their bodies into whirlwinds and, and can change their form. They can shape shift right before your eyes. These are clearly another class of beings. So I think what's gonna have to happen here is we're gonna have to broaden our perspective on the possibility of what other creatures could actually look like or be like. The Garden of Eden story also appears in the book of Ezekiel, where over the course of 12 different verses, there is mention of possible extraterrestrial encounters. One of the all-time great extraterrestrial craft references in the Bible is Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 1 through 28. Ezekiel is one of these wise men from the Temple of Solomon who's been deported to Babylon. He's sitting by the river Chabar. And he describes in his own words, the heavens open, the heavens open. Okay, this is a rip in the fabric of space time. And he next describes something absolutely phenomenal. He says there's a, a cloud with this brightness about it and it's flashing like lightning. He actually saw this vessel not only land, but he actually got inside of it and he took off with the, with the people. He thought that it was God, and they even said to him, no, we're not God. We're here to take you somewhere to meet somebody very important. So basically, it was a very, very good recorded account of a UFO that landed and that somebody got inside of and took off, went to another location to meet another being. And these beings, according to the writings, were not God. So it's very interesting to know that there's a lot of talk about not only UFOs in the Bible, but even people taking off. When examining the Old Testament account of Ezekiel, perhaps one of the most fascinating perspectives to consider comes from Eric Von Daniken, author of Chariots of the Gods. My God, in my opinion, in my dreams, does not need a vehicle in which to move around. God is omnipresent. God is like a spirit. He's always there. Now in the Bible, Prophet Ezekiel describes a strange story. He says, out of a sudden they hear the noise in the sky. All the slaves look up there. Then he sees an object coming down from the sky. Then he realizes that the object makes a tremendous noise. He compares the noise with the thundering of a waterfall. Or he compares it with, with, with fighting wagons. So a terrible noise this object made. All the slaves looking there, the object comes down, sand is blown up. Ezekiel is high priest by profession, so he believes in the beginning it must be God. He fells on his nose to pray to the Lord. And then he realized this is not God. And then he describes exactly what he sees. The wings move. When the wings move, that, that the tremendous noise started to be there again. When the wings stood still, they were hanging down. He describes the leg. He clearly says the leg were out of metal. Then he cries, he cries the wheel, and the wheel shocked him to totally, because the wheel of his times can go forward and backward. But the wheel which he sees here, they go also forward and backward, but at the same time, left and right, without making a steering movement. Ezekiel sees a wheel which goes forward, backward, right and left without making a steering movement. This shocks him so he cannot understand it. He describes it four times. Some uh, 30 years ago, I had a secret speech at the headquarter at NASA in Huntsville in the United States. On this speak, I also talk about five minutes about Ezekiel. And after the speech, we had a dinner together, and there was a, the, the, the chief of the Department of Construction, an ex-German, his name was Joseph Brumrich, 
who came to me and said, that was very interesting. But Mr. von Däniken, in the Bible, you will never found technology. The Bible, this is imagination. These are dreamings, visions, but, but not, not technology. He started to read Ezekiel, and finally he realized that whatever Ezekiel described is real, and he started to reconstruct Ezekiel's description. The outcome was a book with the English title, The Spaceship of Ezekiel. And in the foreword of it, Mr. Joe Blumrich, the ex-chief of the construction department at NASA said, I absolutely started this work to disprove Eric von Däniken's story of Ezekiel. But it was absolutely sensational what comes out. Ezekiel did saw an extraterrestrial spacecraft. Now, Ezekiel's spaceship is not a mother spaceship with which you can move from star to star. Ezekiel's spaceship is only a, a, an object which today we would call space shuttle. You have to have a mother spaceship, and from the mother spaceship, a smaller vehicle comes down to the Earth. So that's what it was. Now, this is very important. I knew the uh, uh, original Ezekiel. I read it uh, the, uh, first in Hebrew. I did not learn specially Hebrew, but we had a Latin translation. And in the original Ezekiel, the word God never appears, never. Ezekiel says it was the splendorness of the highest. The word God in the Bible only comes in later by the translators. The translator, the splendor of the highest, he means God. In the original, the word God is never mentioned. So he continues in the book of Ezekiel and he says that the splendor of the highest arrived a second time. And this time, the hand of the highest put him on the throne. In my view, he was sitting in the co-pilot's chair. And then he describes how they started. He says, and the hand of the highest pressed upon my chest because he feels the gravity when, when starting. He does not know where the trip goes because he says, they brought me on a very, very high mountain. He doesn't know where he is. He looks down and he sees under him something like a city, a small city or a big village. And in the center of it, something like a temple. The, the splendorness of the law comes to a standstill over the temple. Slowly, slowly, he sinks inside the so-called temple. And Ezekiel realized at that moment that the noise of the wings were this time higher and louder than what he had heard before in the desert, because now the echo comes back from the walls of the so-called temple. Then it comes to a standstill. Ezekiel gets out, gets out of the space shuttle, and of a sudden a glittering being appears again, one of the strangers, and he says to Ezekiel, oh humans, you humans, you have eyes to see, but you see nothing, and you have ears to hear, but you hear nothing. And then the, the man in glittering suit gives Ezekiel a measuring device and orders him to measure this whole building, the so-called temple. Ezekiel, in the meantime, he understands that this has nothing to do with God. So he has courage. He asks back to the, the glittering man, why? Why should I measure this temple? And the other one says, that's the reason why we brought you here, humans. So Ezekiel starts to measure length and wide and how many stairs, etc. All this you can read in the Bible, all the measurements of the so-called temple. Now in Germany, we had a German engineer, his name is Hans Herbert Bayer. And he read these measurements and he asked himself, is this a true bull building? Or is it just imagination, fantasy? And he started to calculate exactly according to Ezekiel's measurement. And out comes a building which looks today like a stadium, like a football stadium. And then this German engineer came to me and I, I saw his calculations, absolutely precise. I asked him, have you ever heard of NASA, of Mr. Blumrich's reconstruction? Because NASA did only reconstruct the splendorness of the highest, which means the shuttle, while the German engineer was only reconstructing the so-called temple. So one have the splendorness of the highest and the temple. So I brought the two men together, the German engineer and the NASA engineer. And the space shuttle fit perfectly into the temple, 
by every centimeter. The so-called temple was nothing else but the base station for the extraterrestrial shuttle. It was not God, it was simply the space shuttle of the extraterrestrials. That's God's throne chariot, his celestial chariot. And that's the terminology they would use. But we today would say, well, that's, that's a spacecraft that just came out of a stargate or a wormhole and is suddenly manifested on the Earth plane. So it's a dramatic example of, of what we think of as an extraterrestrial encounter in the Bible. Not only do these celestial type beings appear in the book of Ezekiel, but they're also referenced in other passages from the Bible. If this ancient text is as much a historical document as it is a religious one, might these be clues of a deeper story to our human history? If you look into the other account of Enoch, Enoch had a designated time where he would get into a UFO to lift off with these beings. So much so that he even gave his son the records and the time and the date and everything else that he would be leaving. And uh, he took off. And Enoch is a very, very important person in the Bible. He's mentioned in the Bible several times, even though they omitted his book. And the reason why they omitted his book from the Bible, the book of Enoch, is because it talks about people coming from space and interacting and engaging with mankind. If we consider that advanced beings came with technologies from space and engaged with mankind, might we see evidence of this in the biblical book of Joshua? It is written that the walls of Jericho fell after the Israelites marched around the city blowing their trumpets. They were carrying with them the Ark of the Covenant. Some scholars suggest that Moses and the Israelites acquired a supernatural source of energy at Mount Sinai when they were given the commandments that were later placed within the Ark of the Covenant. Could the Ark have contained an energy source so powerful that it could amplify Joshua's horns and radiate enough sonic frequency to bring down those walls? And if so, what other examples show evidence of this power source? When we're talking about possible extraterrestrial technology, of course we have to talk about the Ark of the Covenant, a device that was transmitted, the blueprint was transmitted by God to an Israelite craftsman, Bezalel, who crafts this device, but before he does, God gives him all the wisdom of the universe to build a simple golden box? No, this is an extraordinary piece of extraterrestrial technology. In fact, we're told that there isn't just one Ark of the Covenant, there's one on the earth, and there's one at the throne of God. They must be connected. And what this opens up is the possibility is that the Ark of the Covenant is just not a simple container, for the, the tablets of the law and the rod of Aaron and the flask of manna and the cruise of anointing oil, as we're told, that in fact the Ark of the Covenant is a far more profound device. That in fact it could in fact be a portal device. This is based on the eyewitness accounts of it in operation in the Holy of Holies of Solomon's Temple, where eyewitnesses like Isaiah report seeing luminous humanoid beings suddenly manifested between the wings of the cherubim guarding the Ark of the Covenant. So it's a profound technology that we're talking about with the Ark of the Covenant. And in the, in the book of Samuel, it says, everyone who came too close to the Ark of the Covenant died. And they describe how they died, that their, their skin became pale, their, their nails and fingers and feet fell out. Uh, they were blind, etc. So they were afraid of the Ark of the Covenant and freely, by free will, they brought it back to Israel. The Israelites the next morning saw that the Ark of the Covenant were here again with four horses. The horses were already near dead. The children of Israel were dancing around the Ark of the Covenant, praying to the Lord that the Ark of the Covenant is back finally from the land of the enemy. And at that morning, so says the Bible, 72 of the Israelites died, including children. What have these children done wrong? The only thing, they were too close to the Ark of the Covenant because the Ark of the Covenant was absolutely dangerous. Humans had no business being around the Ark of the Covenant. It was carried on ring posts, for one thing, for protection, and those who did carry it reported 
what we today would readily interpret as radiation effects. Their hair, their teeth fell out. The whole populations of, of the Philistines were wiped out by something emanating from the Ark of the Covenant because of its radioactive qualities. Found in the book of Exodus is a bush engulfed in flames that does not singe or calcinate. And where God appears with a message for Moses etched in stone. Could this be a reference to visitors using advanced technology? If you look at the story of Moses, he supposedly climbed a mountain and uh, he then met with the Lord who was represented as a burning bush. It's very, very easy nowadays for us to understand that that burning bush may have been some type of technology that he just didn't have the vocabulary to, to explain. And during this interaction with him and this quote unquote deity, he was then given the 10 commandments, which were etched into stone. The only thing that can do that nowadays would be technology. We have laser etching technology, we have different types of technology that can literally etch into stone. So I think that this may be a representation of some type of technology that etched these commandments into stone. And these commandments themselves were given out many thousands of years earlier in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which then made their way into the story of Moses, which is just a reduced version of the 42 Laws of Mott, which may have been something much easier for him to bring down to the people and get them to obey and understand. Throughout the Bible, we've, we hear all these stories. Isaiah has one about beings on clouds. Uh, what is the cloud? Well, the cloud is a, a method of transportation used by these beings. Perhaps, again, it's a language thing where people are looking and saying, oh, this being is riding upon a cloud, but it's actually maybe some kind of a Merkaba throne chariot or an actual technological spacecraft. That's very interesting. In fact, in the book of Acts, there's another uh, reference to this where two angels dressed in white are walking over and these, these men of Galilee, just after the ascension of Jesus, are, are looking up. The, the angels say to the men of Galilee, why, why do you look up? Jesus will return to you on a cloud exactly the same way that he left. And so it's clear that the cloud is not a puffy white thing that we see in our atmosphere. The cloud is some kind of method of conveyance between earth and the heavens. So when you're in the Bible and you're seeing a reference to, oh, I saw a being riding on a cloud, we know that's a reference to some form of a craft. In the United States, the Pentagon has publicly confirmed that recent videos of unidentified aerial phenomena were authentic and admitted they don't know how the technology worked. Even the Vatican has put resources into the discovery of potential extraterrestrial life. The Vatican has been very interested in extraterrestrial life for a long time. They invested millions of dollars into an observatory in Arizona, of all places, looking for extraterrestrial life in our universe. Father uh, Gabriel Funes, who was the director of the Vatican Observatory at the time, who said that just as there's a multiplicity of creatures on the Earth, why can't there be a multiplicity of creatures out in the cosmos that God created other intelligent beings? Who are we to limit God's creativity? Because of my having been chief counsel at the Jesuit National Headquarters uh, in their National Social Ministry Office for 10 years in Washington, D.C., I had access to Father Funes, so I reached out to him right away and actually went to visit him and sat down and had this face-to-face -face conversation with him. And in less than three minutes, he was acknowledging that what he was really talking about was not just microscopic life uh, elsewhere or even little insects or anything on some other planet. He was talking about another highly intelligent, highly technologically developed, but categorically non-human species uh, elsewhere in our galaxy. Uh, and, and that was extraordinarily important. The, the implications are that implied teachings of not only the church, but virtually every human institution uh, down through the ages uh, have, have all been rooted in the kind of unconscious premise that our human species is at the apex of all evolved sentient uh, evolution in the universe. Uh, and for us to discover that that isn't true, uh, that it 
dethrones us from the apex of the pyramid of life in the universe. Pope Francis, when he was uh, confronted with this question about what the beliefs of the church were with regard to the existence of extraterrestrial beings, uh, of saying that, well, he would see no problem at all in baptizing uh, our brethren from an extraterrestrial civilization because uh, all, all life forms are uh, children of God. The, I guess, inertia uh, of the institutional church is causing them to think that the people are a lot more ignorant and dumber than they really are. Uh, and so that, that the, when you say something like, you know, the, the, the Pope would be willing to baptize, to, what makes you think that they want to be baptized by the Catholic Church? You know, I mean, it's like, you know, we, we go down and we find a whole tribe of chimpanzees, you know, and they're talking about being willing to train us on how to eat a banana. You know, I mean, that, that, that's, you, you got to get onto a higher level. While the discovery of advanced intelligent life elsewhere in the universe may seem like a contradiction to conventional religious doctrine, what might the implications be if the highest representatives of the church and other religious institutions acknowledge extraterrestrials in the Bible? So what are the implications of ET interaction in the Bible for us today? I, I, what it tells us is that, one, extraterrestrials have been here for a very long time and have a definite interest in the evolution of humanity. What is the purpose? Well, ultimately, in these stories, it's about showing humanity how to become better versions of ourselves, that we can actually become like the gods, that through our interaction with these beings, we too can ascend to the heavens, whether that means in a spiritual form or traveling in the stars in some form of a craft or through a stargate. Either way, these beings have been here, and most of these stories where we're talking about an interaction with extraterrestrials involve humans somehow going into the stars, going to other places, and sometimes even returning. I believe that when you look at some of the uh, accounts of ancient craft and UFOs and maybe even potentially aliens in the modern day Bible, you look forward to a future where we're moving in the direction of the ancients. We're moving in a direction where we are now obtaining technologies that make us look godlike. I believe that right now, the way we're moving forward in technology, it's going to allow human beings to operate on a telepathic level. We can share information wirelessly like Wi-Fi devices. And I also do believe that our spacefaring technology is going to give us the ability to do things like beam people from one place to another. We are already working on beaming things uh, through the teleportation devices in the laboratories on Earth right now. So the future is going to look much like the things being described in the modern day Bible, except we'll know that it's really advanced technology. Everything is going to change. Everything is going to change. The interpretation of all uh, information on our planet is going to change. We're going to be in a completely new paradigm. And so that we're going to have to view these reports uh, in, in biblical times of encounters with, with beings from some other dimension, uh, some other spiritual plane, uh, of, of vehicles or encounters like in the Ezekiel of this uh, whirling uh, light ship of some sort, you know, that all of these things are going to have to be reinterpreted uh, in light of this. Many of our modern day Abrahamic religions are now being re-examined and their doctrines reshaped based on the idea that we're not alone in the universe. There's a new type of spirituality emerging because the old ways are not as relevant as they once were. More than half of American adults and 75% of young Americans believe we've had contact with some sort of intelligent extraterrestrial life. This level of belief rivals that even of a belief in God. But one day we might discover that the Bible is one of the greatest extraterrestrial contact documents ever written. As we conclude season three of Deep Space, consider the following. If a distant race of ancient aliens once inhabited the lands of the Bible, and these were real life events and not merely visions, then a new paradigm awaits us where science, spirituality, and open contact is the next scripture about to be written.